OK, um, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name's Kate Sutton and I'm one of the deputy directors at the Council for Disabled Children. Um, welcome you to this uh, our national webinar. Um, uh, we have got a really interesting agenda and some uh, we're very lucky to have three uh, wonderful speakers today who um, are going to be talking to us in turn, Anne Pinney, Sarah Martin-Denham and Joanne Harris. And we will get an opportunity to uh, have some Q&A um, in between time. And uh, whilst we will, might have some flex in terms of how the agenda runs, we'll make sure that we finish promptly um, at 12 o'clock and we will be sharing the slides with everybody afterwards. Um, so uh, welcome to um, Anne, Sarah and Joanne. Um, my colleague Thea will be uh, helping today in terms of the slide and monitoring the chat. Um, so um, Anne is um, a True Colours data champion and independent researcher. Sarah is from uh, the University of Sunderland and um, Joanne is from um, the performance and improvement lead education review team in, in North uh, Tyneside Council. Um, if we could just move to the next slide Thea, that would be great. So as I mentioned earlier, if you could remain on mute unless you're the speaker, um, please feel free to use the chat. And when we get to Q&A, you can raise your hand um, if, if there are too many for us to reliably identify. Um, those with the hands up then please use the chat if we don't get the opportunity to follow up questions during the session we'll make sure that we do afterwards um okay thank you next slide please so today's um title is data to intelligence and uh, as we know, without data, we only have opinion. But the important thing is to turn the data stories into something meaningful that can help us with insights and how we work, how we plan, how we deliver, how we commission. So we're going to be sharing emerging practice in, and how data, how to use data to improve outcomes for children and people with SEND. Um, and there's going to be an opportunity to reflect on the use of data within local areas and hearing more specifically around uh, information gathered from local authorities and the further objective is to help us develop a shared understanding between partners about the challenges and the opportunities faced um, in, in using data. Um, thank you Thea. So um, we will be uh, Moving to our first session with Anne, before um, I introduce Anne properly, just to let you know that following Anne's session, there will be an opportunity for um, a QA. and a um, And then we'll be hearing from Sarah with a further Q&A after that. And following that session, we'll be hearing from Joanne um, with a further brief Q&A and an opportunity to go into breakout sessions. Um, in those breakout sessions, there, there, there may or may not be somebody from the Council for Disabled Children with you sort of facilitating that. We are not expecting note taking, but we do want to, everybody to have an opportunity to um, join the discussion. And following the breakout session, there will be coming together for a final plenary discussion um, and a further mentee, which will be helping us think about um, how we take things forward and move on from this session in uh, implementing what we've heard and what we've learned during the conversations and from the presentations. So we've still got people joining us, but I think it's important that we um, start to press on. Um, if anybody is having any difficulties, um, please just put that in the chat and um, Thea or our colleagues from the CDC can um, help where possible. Um, as I say, we will be sharing the, sharing the slides afterwards and the session is being recorded so that we're able to uh, share the recording for those colleagues who haven't been able to join today for various reasons. Right, so um, handing over first to Anne. Um, Anne has long worked with the Council of Disabled Children as a True Colours data champion as, and an independent researcher. And uh, Anne's going to be talking us through the importance of uh, linking data on children and people with SEND and how through linking that data it's possible to, um, she'll be sharing insights from six local areas 
um, and sharing findings from freedom of information request on the extent of which data linkage is taking place um, with local authorities and uh, independent independ um, uh, ICBs. So um, um, the three sessions um, fit well together. Um, we'll be um, hearing from Sarah afterwards in terms of how um, data has driven her work around challenging school exclusions. And then finally from Joanna in terms of developing data measures to improve SEND system partnerships. OK, so Anne, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's always a pleasure to to work with CDC and to join your seminars. There's always a tremendous audience, and I do hope you'll chip in lot this, a lot this morning. Um, I had to say yes to this invitation because from data to intelligence is just absolutely central to the work I've been doing for a long time now. It's all about trying to get better value from the data that you routinely have to report. Um, so all that national administrative data that disappears into a, a vortex and um, doesn't necessarily look terribly useful. But if you sit down around a table, look at it, share it, try and join it up, it can help you to ask some really valuable questions that ultimately help you improve services and outcomes for, for the children and young people we serve. So that's what it's all about. And um, I'm delighted to be speaking with Sarah and Joanne because they're two fabulous colleagues who I've met through my work. Um, Sarah is, Sarah's presentation is gonna be a real treat. Um, it's really lovely because it shows you how you can use data as a starting point and, and really fly with it. And that's what she's gonna be doing today, but she can tell you more about it. Um, and Joanne has got some fantastic local examples. She's, um, she was one of the case study areas um, who helped me out with my um, data linkage case study research this summer and she's got some tremendous examples to share. So uh, I'm just going to do a bit of an introductory presentation and then we'll, we'll go on to these more interesting ones I think. So um, let me find how to drive the slides there. There we go. So I'm going to talk a wee bit about data linkage if you'll uh, indulge me and i'll try not to be too technical on it um and why it's worth thinking about why it's worth doing in fact i may be telling you how to suck eggs here because a majority of local authorities and health bodies are already doing aspects of this uh, and it's really growing fast um a little bit about me for or why i'm interested in this for those of you i haven't met um I've sort of been doing special needs and disability research for a couple of decades now and right from the very first study I did which was with the audit commission back in 2002 we just found a dearth of useful data to understand what was going in on with the SEND cohort we didn't even have needs data in England when I did that study and then the first time I tried to triangulate the data was in 2005 when uh, I was freelancing with DfE and they said, uh, could I tri triangulate health, social care and education data to understand how many disabled children with complex needs were in residential placements? It was a horrible study to do. I tore my hair out over this and I just thought I was putting together apples and pears and bananas and it wasn't useful. But actually, it was still being quoted in policy 15 years later. It was worth making that effort. And... I haven't left it ever since. It stayed in my mind. I still want to answer those questions. And the data isn't good enough at the moment to answer those questions. But by putting it together, we get a lot closer to a robust answer. And that's sort of the journey that I've been on. Um, the, the True Colours Data Champion um, comes from back in 2006-07 CDC. Yeah. Hello, can I speak again? I'm not, sorry, I don't know what happened there. Um, back in 2016, Christine Lenahan and True Colours came and said, did I mind having another go at triangulating the data to understand what was going on with trends in complex needs in the same world? Once again, the data wasn't good enough to answer it authoritatively, but it did flag up all, th all sorts of things we needed to work on and improve. And a big part of that effort has been trying to make it easier for local authorities to join up their data. 
There we go. So um, data linkage, I won't spend long on definitions, but just, just a quick word. Um, it's, it's not all that complicated. It is about putting together the data jigsaw really. So uh, data linkage is about being able to identify the same individuals or the same groups like the SEND cohort or indeed different units like family units consistently across different data sets. And that enables us to draw conclusions across different data sets. So to understand, for example, how an intervention in health might impact on education outcomes further down the line and to understand whole system impact or just to, to understand that we're talking about the same children. So at a, a most basic level for the social care uh, service to understand uh, how many of their children have SEND and the SEND service to understand how many of their children have social care needs and how that might be impacting their experience and their outcomes. Data linkage and data matching are the same thing. You can use those terms interchangeably. Data sharing is a much broader concept. Um, at one level, it's, it's the really detailed stuff. It's getting together and sharing records like health and social care do in some areas or the police and social care sometimes or primary and secondary health. But data sharing can just be a much broader, looser thing of actually just looking at your high level data and trying to understand what's going on. So it's, it's a, a much looser concept, that one. Um, I've been working with Sunderland University for the last few years, gosh, three or four years maybe, um, on a couple of really ambitious data linkage projects uh, where we're triangulating data on children and young people with learning disabilities and another one where we're focusing on those who've ever experienced a school exclusion and trying to understand risk factors and pathways. Sarah's going to talk more about the exclusions work. But I just mentioned this now because the date, the evidence I'm about to draw on comes from the work I've been doing with Sunderland, and it's been a really tremendous partnership. So we got a little bit of funding last year to do an FOI to all local authorities and ICBs to find out how much data linkage was actually going on at the moment. Um, and we also did some local field work, which is how I met Joanne, to find out uh, to learn directly from local authorities who are already linking their data and ICBs, apologies. So um, drawing on that learning, why would we want to link local data on children and young people with SEND? These were the six key themes that came out from those six local authorities that, that I spoke to, and I'm going to group them in, into three pairs here. So I started off with some desk research, and it was striking how much better SNAs were for areas that were already linking their data. You know, you can draw a line around the SEND cohort, you know which children and young people you're talking about with confidence. So the first two themes were really to do that stuff that's expected by the Children and Families Act of planning together, understanding your cohorts together, commissioning services together. Um, and joining up the data is, is very powerful in doing that. Uh, with examples, for example, of um, speech and language therapy, of uh, looking at the data on the backlogs, understanding you know, which children are being missed and, and doing joint commissioning to fill those gaps. Um, understanding patterns of service uses and pressure points and gaps in provision, which children are being sent out of area, which children need specialist placements, which children are, are out of school or experiencing exclusions disproportionately. And so therefore improving uh, early intervention for children with autism or SEMH or what have you. So many powerful examples of really drilling down in the data to understand who was falling through the net and where services needed to be extended. The next two themes were around early intervention and targeted responses, which of course is so important in terms of getting the system back on a, a sustainable basis and making a real difference to children and families. So around early intervention, we had again, reducing school exclusions, reducing out of area in place, placements, and some lovely examples in terms of targeted responses around individual children and young people. So there's, there's case studies on each of these, but just to, to mention some of the targeted ones, 
in Bradford, they told me about how they're triangulating their data on vulnerable children and young people and using it as a live data dashboard to monitor this cohort. And they have a complex and vulnerable panel so they can actually target support uh, using this live, live data. And it's become a key operational tool for service managers. Uh, in Hartlepool, they are notifying, as you're meant to under the Children and Families Act, uh, health are notifying the local authority when they think a young child or a baby has got a disability. Uh, so that they can plan ahead on an individual basis to ensure that specialist provision is in place when that child wants to go on to nursery or start primary school. That's the sort of planning ahead that families really want. It's, it's powerful and, it, and it's important. And the last two themes around understanding impact and enabling a whole system response and strengthening partnership working, some of the cultural change. So the understanding impact, those areas that were linking data were finding it really useful for being able to tell a much more coherent joined up story to Ofsted and CQC about what they understood to be the challenges and having data to evidence it. They were better able to populate their data framework. So, so many of you have worked hard to co-produce data outcomes frames, frameworks to understand outcomes for children and young people with SEND. And joining up your data helps to, to map the administrative data, which doesn't necessarily fit well with those outcomes that matter to children and young people. And it can have quite a profound effect in terms of the cultural change, strengthening partnership working. And there was a lovely example from Bedford Borough Council of um, sharing the data on the take up of health checks for young people with learning disabilities. Um, and actually, rather than which and the take up was low and services saying, well, how can we help and social care and education, therefore prompting families to go and have their annual health checks um, and being part of the solution. So a really important cultural change there. Uh, more case studies and more data is available in the in the briefing itself, which has just been published last week. And there's a link to it on the slide. And I'm also going to pop it in the chat here. Um, so that's that briefing um, if you want to find out more. Um, so in terms of uh, from the FOI responses, how many areas were actually joining up their data? There was more going on than we expected. A majority of local authorities and ICBs are already linking their data. So there's lots of practice to build on now and lots of internal expertise. But what we found was that they tend to be linking their own data. So in local authorities, typically education and social care data and health, different health data sets. But joining across the two remains much, much harder for a variety of reasons. Um, it was being used most commonly at, at cohort level for strategic planning and data dashboards. You know, C CDC developed its integrated data dashboard and many of you have got your own data dashboards and your reports with KPIs which are reviewed regularly by joint panels um, and then you commission deep, deep dives and go away and look into to particular issues. Um, it wasn't being used as much as we expected for joint commissioning at the moment, particularly on the local authority side. Um, joint commissioning was being used slightly more on the health side. But just to give you some of the stats, and the stats are in the briefing, um, in terms of the internal use, sorry, got it written down here. So around, around three quarters of local authorities and around three quarters of ICBs are actually already linking internal data sets. But linking across the two, it's just under a quarter of local authorities are linking with health data. And around 16% of ICBs are linking with local authority data. So that's a, a key area for development. That's where we are at the moment. But I do think it's changing rapidly, and particular with, particularly with the advances that are being made sort of at the adult end of things and linking health and social care data now. Just a wee bit on the policy context. Um, 
there are moves in policy to support this. Generally, government policy is supportive of data linkage. There is a, a nerdy national data strategy that's very strongly in support of this. There has been national data infrastructure funding, which we benefited from in one of the Sunderland projects. We got a data accelerator fund grant there. But in terms of children's policy, the key driver has been um, the supporting families program or the troubled families program before because they had an integrated out uh, they had a, a cross-cutting outcomes framework and payment by results and that prompted a lot of local authorities to try and join up their data a bit um, but there were positive noises made in both the send review and the um, children's social care review towards um, data linkage and data sharing um, Send review absolutely hit the nail on the head in focusing on the challenges of linking education and health data for this cohort. So, so important. Um, the children's social care reviews linked, focused more on sharing data for safeguarding and particularly joining up the social care and the health data. And I've been working with both those policy teams and trying to encourage them to to link with each other because, of course, children's lives are not in silos and really we need to put the whole jigsaw together. And at local level, when I've been doing the local area research, that's what you're doing already. In fact, you, you are ahead of national government on this one, but I do think national government could provide more leadership and make it easier for you to join up the data and provide a clearer national steer. Excitingly, there are some pilots planned around using NHS numbers as well, around consistent child identifiers, including NHS numbers. Um, and they are going to include SEND and education now, which is really, really positive, And that will be later in the year. So that's a quick roundup from me. I'd be delighted to answer any questions. Um, there are more, there's more data, more case studies, more answers in the briefing that I've shared the link to, and indeed in Sarah and Nathan, my Sunderland colleagues' briefings that are published there too. Um, but we would love to find out from you as well, if you are already linking data. Kate, did we want to go into this directly or do we want to do questions first? Do people want an opportunity to ask questions first? If I see a couple of hands go up, I'll assume that's the case. Otherwise, we can go into the poll. No, show. Oh, I can see one question. Fiona, would you like to ask your question? Hi, I'm from Devon ICB and I'm trying at the moment really hard to create an integrated dashboard for the ICB to get a picture of across all the different priorities we have. But for SEND, I'm really trying my hardest for local authority that um, we work with three local authorities. So it's quite, obviously you've got not just one, you've got three in the patch to work with to sort out a data sharing agreement. But from, from your point of view, what is what is the biggest barrier um, with the local authorities and with health? Because we're both really keen. It's just really hard, I think, with the information governance aspect. So any kind of, tips, suggestions, uh, help with that? Uh, so, so my briefings have just do quite a lot on barriers and enablers, but I think it's um, sort of high level strategic support. So to know that you've got a clear steer to do this is really important on both sides so that you can unblock any, any problems. And then actually just trying to do it, sitting, getting together, and working through the IG, there will be data protection officers or data yeah, data officers on both sides who may have different opinions and they need to come to a shared view. <laughs> and then working through it. And um, yeah, the areas that I went to, they've all had working parties that have worked through it and it's been quite a learning experience, um, but they've got through it within a year on the whole. Um, but yeah, having that high level support and, and a working party to do it. Um, and having that knowledge, so for it to be jointly owned, um, if, you, if you've got people who have worked in both the local authority and health, who therefore understand the different pressures, the different data that's available, but the different pressures and requirements on both sides, that seems to really help as well. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Fiona. Shall we go? I just think, does Joanne or Sarah want to add to that? Because they've both gone through this. Um, I can probably mention a bit when I come to 
my first slide and I think because that's about the data linkage projects. OK, thank you. Well, Joanne, because I know that you've you've successfully got help in there and, and that was perhaps more straightforward than some other areas. I think that, like you say, it it is part um, it is that support from a and from the partnership um, to be able to do that and um, to be able to get to um, progress. I think that is one of the most important important things and um, as well I think it, it just it does feel doesn't it always particularly data sharing it always feels like an absolute minefield and I think sometimes that that becomes our own barrier to it um, which it doesn't need to be necessarily there there'll be experts in in all the organizations for in terms of information governance so in terms of that and there are probably there probably exists some data sharing agreements that maybe you're not so aware of that that could be uh, adjusted and amended to be able to to share some of this data as well another thing is um some of those nhs commissioning units have been really helpful in some areas like we've been working quite help quite closely with the northeast commissioning support unit and they've had real expertise in doing this in other areas that they've been able to bring to the process yeah i think the key thing we've learned is to just to do one thing to do the first thing so maybe get people together in a meeting about this uh, i think the mistake we made was we're just going to link data and it's going to be easy um so i i will talk about that when i go into my two projects but i think it's just not seeing it as a we're going to link data and this is the end point like what are the steps and i know i don't know whether it's the right time to mention we are developing a toolkit which will be freely of publicly available through a funding award we have in the upcoming weeks which we if cdc are happy that we can distribute that and um we could we could do that but it, it's patience and determination i think underlying all of this to be able to get to the end point you've got to have that drive and determination and persistence to get there which you will Thank you, and we would be delighted to share on your behalf. Thank you, oh, and, and the toolkit. That's 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 no problem. We've got uh, one other question in the chat, and then we'll move to the mentee if that's okay. So uh, Daniel asks, "Have you seen any success with data warehousing?" Um, it's not my area of expertise, data warehousing. I'm afraid, so I, I'm going to struggle to to answer that one. Do others, are others in the audience able to answer that? Perhaps, perhaps if they are, they could respond in the chat. They haven't been so far, so maybe, uh, maybe that's a difficult question at the moment. Can I suggest then that uh, we move on to the mentee? Um, if you haven't already done so, you can see on the screen there's the, the link, the QR code, and then also in the chat as well, and the code that you need to access. So we're really keen to see, um, does your local area link data on children and people with SEND already? Um, so please go ahead and then we can see on screen uh, as people are inputting uh, what, what if you haven't already. So please, please join in as we can see on screen. As the people join, the columns will change. So it's good to see that uh, the two majority areas are yes, we are, or it's in development. Um, few link with health data at the moment. So the code uh, is also in the chat if you scroll up above the mentee, if people are still having difficulty getting in. Thank you, Sam. And the yes, kindly put the link in as well. So Anne, what we're seeing on screen, would this be what you would expect? We actually found that there, there were more linking local authority data. Um, so, so there were more who were already linking and fewer in development. But um, 
Yes, so that, that's, what, that's what's different. I'm, I, I'm encouraged to see there's nine who are linking local authority and health data already, and well done you. Uh, and there might have been more if we hadn't put uh, with send at the end of that sentence. And yeah, quite often in writing these briefings and working in this area, um, it's, it's not just about send, it's about any, any vulnerable cohort really. Um, it's about improving understanding any vulnerable cohort and there probably will be, again, for, for local development, there may be t other teams like those doing supporting families in your authority or ICB who are already linking data who could help with this as well. Um, so there probably are higher numbers if we hadn't said send specifically there. I think certainly from a health perspective, um, if you're linking data, then thinking more broadly than send um, in terms of a descriptor will help you um, in terms of your data linkage. Yeah, and there's there's a lot of work trying to link primary and secondary care data. There's, there's lots of really interesting developments. I think in 10 years time, it's going to be a really different picture and it's just going to be business as usual. But it, but it is sort of still cutting edge at the moment. And uh, so sharing information and toolkits, as we heard earlier, are really critical in sort of giving people the kind of the tools and the confidence to progress in their local area. So a uh, question in the chat about the North East Commissioning Support Unit. Um, I'm sure that we can provide that um, information for you, Daniel. Um, that contact. OK. Uh, there we go. Thank you, Anne. Um, perhaps offline, we might be able to share more specifically um, an email address. So uh, opportunity before we move on in terms of our agenda for any other questions that people might have for Anne or any thoughts that people have in terms of the survey information that we can see on screen at the moment. So please do put your hands up. Joahan. I was just going to say that in a way I would expect more, well, the in development because um, I think that this is one of those things that once you start you realise what else could be possible or you'd like to hope what else could be possible so in an ideal world we'd be more in development and less having totally cracked it because there's always something else isn't there but that's maybe just a personal opinion on that. No you're right it's, it's absolutely a journey isn't it? <laughs> Each bit of the jigsaw helps you ask more questions and want to find out more. It's it's good to see the breadth of the local authority areas and uh, health areas represented today. So as well as being in development, the kind of the, the drive and the commitment to wanting to progress this area. Any other questions? OK. Um, thank you, Anne. But you will be staying with us all morning, won't you? So as we go into as we go into other uh, Q and A uh, discussions, there'll be an opportunity for, as Joanne and Sarah have done, for you to be able to sort of uh, join in with this kind of the responses to the um, the questions and and the discussion. But but thank you very much for that presentation. So we're going to move on to the next part of our agenda. So Sarah is going to be talking to her about her work in challenging school exclusions through data. Uh, Sarah, over to you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, it's lovely, lovely to be here. Um, so thank you for the invitation to join. Yeah, what I thought I would do is um, go through a couple of the projects, how we are using data for intelligence. Um, I have five projects at the moment, five research projects, two service evaluations. Um, one, two are looking at the process of linking the data. So we're attempting to link um, health data sets with local health authority data sets. I think one of them is on month 30 and the other is on month 17. 
So I'll talk a little bit about those. And then in addition to that, in the local area, so I'm at the University of Sunderland. In the local area of Sunderland, I've done a lot of qualitative research, um, particularly in Sunderland, but also in five wider local authority areas on voice. So looking at particularly child and parent voice and using that for intelligence. What we know is data can only tell you so much. It doesn't get underneath the lived experience of those who um, quite happily often will share their insight into what, what's happening and how it affects them. So particularly around school exclusions, I think it, it, I've got to be heading 300 children that I've spoken to now through often through the creative arts. So I've moved from kind of conversations in schools now to something called pull up a chair, which I'll talk to you about today. I'm actually in the middle of a pull up a chair. Um, I'm, sat, I'm working with um, 12 young people at the moment who've struggled through secondary education. So I'll share, talk a bit more about those two different types of data and how they can give insight. And yeah, please feel free to ask as many questions as you like. Um, next, am I next sliding? Was, uh, oh yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this all happened. So I was a primary school teacher and um, I decided that I wanted to change. So I went and worked at a college, working with young people who hadn't been successful at GCSEs. And from there, um, did some work there with um, young people across levels from entry all the way through to foundation degrees and ended up at the university, predominantly teaching around special educational needs and disability and childhood adversity. So I personally have lived experience. Um, and at the time I had a, have two children. One of them was um, particularly struggling with dyslexia. So I've got a bit of, bit of experience as a parent, lived experience myself. And at the university, I became predominantly known for teaching around SEND. And then in 2016, I was approached by Sunderland City Council, who at the time weren't quite clear about the prevalence of special educational needs in the city. There was rising needs, they knew that. Um, and at the time, they just felt that they needed a better understanding from the school census data of what that was telling them that was happening locally. So publication in 2017, it's got the key findings there. So at the time, there were still statements in that transfer um, over to EHCPs. But what it did show is that um, autism rates were higher than national and social, emotional, mental health needs were significantly higher than the national rate. And not on there also, specific learning difficulties in the school census data were extremely low. And whether or not that was compounding the SEMH needs through unmet or unknown needs, we wanted to investigate. So the impact of just that school census, looking at the school census data provided evidence. Um, money was also provided on top of that money from DfE locally and a new school was opened. So I think that really shows the power of analysing. That was just one local authority data set that led to that funding. That's a brilliant school now. I think it's actually full. As won't surprise those of you who are in local authority areas at the moment on, on this call. As part of that study, I identified um, that it seemed like we weren't identifying soon enough. So though I did some interviews as part of that study as well, and it, it was very much a sense that we kind of wait for children to fail or get suspended. And we, there must be a better way. So how can we have that earliest intervention? And I suggested, could there be a system where a school identifies a child struggling? And through that, we're able to do some kind of intervention and assess for needs. That was particularly around the specific learning difficulties. So these assessment hubs now do assessments with an educational psychologist to look for underlying challenges with learning. So that was the first piece of work. And that's kind of been the platform to everything that's happened since. Right, so next one. So the following year, um, they came back to me. It was actually Together for Children in Sunderland. And at the time, like local areas across the country, suspensions or fixed period exclusions, as they were known at the time, and permanent exclusions were increasing to a concerning level. So what they asked me to do at that point is we'd looked at school census data, we had that information, it was like, right, how can we actually go and speak to people who are who are experienced in this area? So it was meant to be 100 
semi-structured interviews, I got completely carried away. Um, and I didn't want to turn any parents and children or professionals down. So it ended up being a huge study over a two year period. And you can see there, there was 55 children aged five to 16 that I went to play groups. I went to infant schools um, and just played and had conversations to see what were the barriers and enablers to mainstream school for these children, young people. Parents of children who'd experienced exclusion, 41 of those, and then health professionals. Um, education and health professionals in that as well. So that study, there's a link there. There was actually three quite substantial reports. One was um, enablers and barriers to mainstream schooling. The second was about the managed move process because what came out through those conversations was the managed move system wasn't working. And you will know that administrative data isn't captured on managed moves either, which I think is there's, I've also got a policy brief on that is a huge concern. We don't know how many moves children have and we don't know the success of those moves. So lots of findings there, class sizes, um, inconsistency, absolutely unreasonable adjustments. So parents saying that um, in some cases that they were told they'd have to have a diagnosis of need to get reasonable adjustments made um, in there. And absolutely horrifyingly, a number of children told me they were held in isolation booths, some for up to three years of their statutory secondary school education. Um, this was fact checked because I couldn't actually believe what I was hearing. Um, yeah, there was children kept in there as I suppose their statutory education. Some children were pulling hair out, some children weren't allowed to cough, um, restricted toilet breaks. So it kind of showed the physical, the, not only the emotional impact of isolation booths, but also the physical. So vomiting, stomach aches, um, and leading to extreme social, emotional, mental health needs. Compounding school exclusion. Children don't want to be in there. They will find a way to get out. What I'm currently learning, what I've learned from this study, it is ongoing, that there's kind of what we're learning through the, the conversations with children and parents is there's a spiral. So a child gets a sanction, goes into school, they're wearing trainers because they're, either the parents couldn't afford shoes or their shoes were wet from the previous day. They put on trainers, they might get an S code or a C code, whatever they're calling it. And that for some children can cause an absolute spiral. And then they're in, they get a detention, they, get, um, they then get moved to um, isolation. What we are learning, and I'm still learning from this study, I was meeting with um, somebody in a different, County Council yesterday, where children maybe have 30 de school detentions outstanding in the summer term. So when they come back in September, the slate isn't clean, they go back in with that number of detentions to still have. So there's a huge issue around which this identifies about the barriers to school and the impact of that. So yeah, next one, please. So this is this is just a in the publication, um, the Managed Move publication. I can send specific links to, because there's a lot. So what I did is it, through following conversations with children and parents and professionals, we kind of came up with a, a model that the local area could adapt and use to try and look at how we can better manage a managed move. It's not an administrative data, but we do know from the, well, for locally, the intelligence we got was that some children had up to three managed moves in a year. One young person told me that um, he'd had three had his backpack and his shoes on. That was his third managed move. And it just resulted in them completely disengaging with education. And there's some comments um, there as well alongside that. So yeah, that's kind of a model where it goes through what are the steps that would help? What are the communication steps? We need an advocate in schools and it needs to be a really well managed process um, with a clear communication channel. So children on a managed move are automatically put into isolation to prove their way out, for example, that they are given a supported process to make that successful. Okay, next one, please. 
Right, so just talk quickly. I'm, I'm aware I don't want to run out of time. Um, I've got two data linkage projects at the moment. One is called Lifestart, which is using the local route to data linking. So that's local agreements with South Tyneside and Sunderland Foundation Trust together for children who hold the data for on behalf of Sunderland City Council and NEX. So um, NEX are the processor on behalf for the health data. That's um, one project. So that's looking, that's got the community services data set. The local route's got the community services data set. It has um, school census data, SEN2 data, and children in need data. What you're looking on the, on the screen, however, is it was funded by the local data accelerator, accelerator fund. Um, it was together for children that secured the money and they commissioned me at the university with my team, including Anne Pinney, to carry out a service evaluation and it's been an absolute I want to it is a delight because you get to work with NECS are fantastic together for children are fantastic and we've also got South Tyneside in this group as well and everybody in our kind of group driving this forward are determined there have been numerous hurdles so things like you don't know you're going to need eye guard you don't know you're going to need a data services protection toolkit. You don't know you ultimately were at the point of DARS now and that process, but it's all doable. It's just having kind of that can do, that sounds awful, like that. There's this other thing in the way now, oh, and then we've got to do this other thing, and we've got to do this other thing, but actually just focusing on that one step, do this one step, then do the next step, then the next step. Now, as, um, as Duane said really well, this is exactly what's happened this project is you go oh well we could actually the child health record would be useful should we see if we can get that and so it's kind of grown so originally it wasn't going to be SEN2 data we were didn't think we would get primary care data GPs are now signing up to that so these are the data sets we are currently getting um through the through the route we are, we are now with this project at DARS so we've got a DARS caseworker which you need and we're just working through that. The problem we've got, which you might face as a face as authority, is this project is now end month is for both of them is March. So the process, because I need to be honest with you, the process is it's hard and you've got to want it. But what we're going to get, if you look at that there, and we're going to have link data, it's going to be a dashboard for the local area. But as a university, we'll get individual pseudonymized data that we can then use to look at for this one patterns for school exclusion. I'll come to something called a theograph in a little bit in a minute. But um, what we know is we seem to get a glut of children from year six, year seven transition, year nine, 10 and 11. And for some of those children, I know from the intelligence from my conversations with parents that they're identifying concerns at the two year check. So what what are the points that we can learn by linking this data to look at which services they've touched been referred to over time what are the points where we could intervene so what were the points where we could have prevented those suspensions exclusions is there something we're missing what we have learned we already have the community services data set for um the um, local area route and it's not complete so sometimes in local areas you might expect diagnostic data to be somewhere but actually it's sitting in another floor somewhere else um, but I'm happy to have follow-up conversations if that's helpful right I'll move to next slide because there's probably going to be questions about that but we can save them till the end okay I do want to talk about pull up a chair please stop me if my time runs out but um pull up a chair um is incredible so I've done those 174 conversations and the words on paper and they're really powerful it's full of child voice and it gave the local area a really good understanding of what their children and young people felt what parents felt and because I'm independent people opened up so parents would talk to me quite openly and children and professionals but what I felt was missing was faces I think there's so much power and it's a horrible word data, but that's what it is. Pull up a chair is film and it's work. I work with a theatre director, a filmmaker and myself as creative director. And we created film. So we started with 10 children at the university 
from two different alternative provisions and we created called See Me. So they called it See Me and that is where the idea of pull up a chair came from these young people. Then phase two, didn't, the children wanted to carry on, more children wanted to get involved. We then did, um, we used spray graffiti paint and they, they sprayed what brought them joy. It was a national exhibition. It was a huge celebration locally. And then See Me South, 15 children in the Bristol area got involved in pull up a chair as well. And then there's been, I think now, I must be at about 20 films. So I've done films with children who've been permanently excluded, suspended. And what it gives you that nothing else gives you is it gives you a child voice in a way that you cannot watch it and think, I don't need to change practice. It celebrates the solutions. It, they tell you what they need, what they want to thrive in school outside of school but it's done in a very balanced way the, the young people I'm working with at the moment um this is phase um seven you can see on here absolutely fantastic and it does change what happens locally it gives them a voice they get taller but also it gives the local area actually what do we need do we need a different provision do we need change out what the focus is in teach training what do we need so if you can go to the next slide, what I'm going to do is show you, have I got time? I hope I have. Um, there's links on here. Now, if you, we, we won't do this now, but if you click on either of those links, it will take you to a page I've got at the university where all the films are stored. So if the pull up a chair children, you get the films and you also get a training pack for your schools and it's all free. So it's about four and a half hours of training for schools to use to prevent exclusions. It's called Pull Up A Chair. Super easy to navigate the site. Please have a look if you if you can and try and get your schools to do that. It has seems to have a positive impact here on preventing exclusion. Free CPD for schools as well. Can I um, go to the next slide? And I'm just going to show you um, the first film. We are thinking about if we can package this for local areas as a pull up a chair process, I'm about to go. Um, I've just been commissioned again by another local authority. They've got 500 children who are out of school. So we need to, we can have data, quantitative data, we can have local authority data, but actually getting their voice is going to be really powerful. Right, if you could press play, and this is the first, it's about three minutes, first film we did with two APs.
Okay, I hope everyone's okay. I normally do a bit of a warning before that, but it it, it started, so I hope everybody's all right. Um, what's important to know about pull up a chair is it's all their words. There is nothing in there that's my words or the film director, the theatre directors. It's all from them. I'm absolutely goose pimple. I get it every time when I when I play that. Um, yeah. So really, really powerful, unique has to be really carefully managed so i'm quite fortunate i'm experienced with ethics so it's all about the consent the consent process is different for film with children so um yeah so please get in touch if if, if i can support in any way with that can we go next how many minutes have i got left can i ask because i'm aware that i'm probably running over you can go for another couple sarah another couple Okay, well, I won't show the other films because I want to progress to something else. This little boy's called Cher. I have permission to say his name. Fantastic. So the youngest children, you'll see this in the films as well. They share what helps them thrive in school. And what's lovely after I launched these films, which was 2022, then ones with parents 2023, people went back to school and emailed me saying something simple like a mindfulness box has really helped, helped in their schools. Can you just skip um, to the next? Not the next side, I think it's the one after. It's a theograph one after that one. Yeah, so this, um, yeah. That disc you quickly saw there, which you'll see on the, the, the screen, is an intervention I want to try with parents, which is getting them to think about risk and protective factors for exclusion. But if you look at this, this is something, actually, you've got the next side, it's a better example, if that's all right. It's called a theograph, and this is from, um, you'll be able to see this better when you print it off. But basically what you do with an interview with a parent is you go through from preschool, have a conversation with them about what were the risk factors, so they're the reds at school, health and family, and what were the positives. And what you can see here is things like a lack of assessment or a lack of um, possibly a school being that gatekeeper to an EHCP and saying, you're not going to meet the threshold, don't apply. So then the parent doesn't. But actually, this child on this example here, the request first came in when the child was, I think, seven for an EHCP, they were turned away about three times by schools saying no, not, not always local authorities. This child finally got an EHCP when they were 16, two months before they left school. So something like a, a process, and I get my SENCOs to do this in the training I do with them, trying to plot that lifespan so far and look for those risks and protective, and that's where the data linkages come from. This, having this intelligence alongside pull up a chair, and everything else we've done is going to give us in Sunderland a really strong picture of how to respond to emergent need. And I will stop there. There is um, other links on here as well that might be helpful, but I don't want to eat into Joanne's time. Sarah, you're not eating into Joanne's time, you're eating into the Q&A time. So That's you okay then. Which That's is okay. so it is an opportunity for people to come in and thank you so much for sharing your work and the, the power that bringing together the data and the insight with an approach that is very much child centred. And I know that you can only stay with us until 10 past 11, because if you've explained, you're, you're kind of part way through your morning working directly with a group of children and people in the um, pull up a chair. Um, work that, that you're doing. So thank you for taking the time out. Um, I think there's been a few questions in the chat that Anne very kindly has been responding to with links and things as we go. But it's an opportunity now if anybody wants to raise their hand and while wow, we've still got Sarah, ask her any questions. You find Sarah, there's usually a pause and then suddenly, ah, Diana, do you want to come in? Hi, thanks, Sarah. That was um, that was amazing. Um, so I'm Diana. I'm um, family care advisor in NHS England Send team, and um, I'm a parent of a young man who has had a lot of school exclusion. So it really, a lot of it, you know, really resonated. And my really my question was, how do we know what we don't know? So the early early stages that you decide, or you know, the authority decides. This is an area worth investigating and and putting resource into. To you know, I know there was the, there was the basic data around high levels of school exclusions, but I I worked for Parent Care Forum and it often felt that the very early intelligence would come from that stuff on the ground. You know that and and Parent Care Forums often pick things up from different sources. So have you got any views about how how do we 
know what the next big thing is and getting in there early in terms of starting a process of of looking at the data and bringing things together? I think local authorities know if suspensions and permanent exclusions are escalating. I know um, at the moment I'm doing a blanket project. It's a separate thing. But there were 2,999 permanent exclusions and suspensions every school day in England using the DfE data equivalent. We know the data is higher for the following year. And already this autumn, exclusions are really high, particularly permanent exclusions. So I think local areas know what's happening locally. The meeting I had yesterday, they've got about 500 children just not in school and they don't know why. They need to find, it's like having that question, isn't it? It's having that question and curiosity mindset and thinking, what do we need to understand more about? Because we can't just have children disappearing off roll and not asking questions about is it the education system, is it the health system, is it community? Like what are the factors and what what provision can we put in place to address or try and address that? And I think the only way we can know that is to go and ask them. But we need the other day as well. We just need it, we need it all, don't we? We need to, it's like you need all of the pieces of the jigsaw. I think, and that's what pull up a chair certainly gives is that is those pieces to put together and go, we could try and do something differently. And I don't even know if that answered your question. It's you wouldn't, I think local I suppose areas I suppose the question is, you know, so so some of the things you're talking about. So for example, those young people who are getting diagnosis very late on because it's all seen as behavioural early on. And and I saw this on SEM panel and 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 sort of anecdotally and stuff. And and how how do you as, you know, perhaps another question is how do you as a parent care reform saying this is something that you've really got to look at, you know, look at your data. How how do you push how do you get to that first step of actually getting what you're doing going? And I know this webinar is, you know, a great opportunity to push that across other areas, but it sometimes feels when you're coming from a parent care forum perspective, that it's really, really difficult to get people to focus on those big issues, and and what can, you know, what can we do to to push that forward at an early stage? I think it's relationships. What what I've learned is, you can do anything if you've got the relationship and you've got a contact. You've got a contact of someone who will listen and take that forward. But like Anne said as well, it's that strategic leadership, isn't it? Like, do you have like a multi agency partnership where you've got all of those professionals and parents and hopefully young people on that where you can have the conversations. Um, Anne and Joanne also have their hands up. Um, as you know, yeah, can add? I, yeah, I just there was one thing again from my local area research on developing the data linkage. Um, all of those areas had parent carer representatives on their working groups around data. Mm -hmm. So at different levels sometimes, but very often on the group on the the groups that sort of commission the deep dives and they would so they would have their data and they would parent carer representatives would be part of that conversation of what does the data tell us and sort of sharpening the focus on what they needed to do their deep dives into but there was often three layers you often had your sort of the highest level looking at their kpis and then the operational managers and the deep dives of working groups and, and parent carers were always on one of those at least and often two Mm -hmm. and really adding value to the process, helping to make sense of the data. Thanks. I was just going to add that the Parent Care Forum is part of our governance structure, and so do you have the opportunity to share those things that are highlighting, you know, the big issues for families. And I mean, thankfully, I guess a lot of the time it does match what, what we would say as well, um, but it does give that other perspective as well, doesn't it? Thank you, Sarah Anne and Joanne. Um, we've still got a couple more minutes before um, Sarah has to leave us. Um, are there any other questions that uh, people want to raise? Well, we've got the opportunity to talk to Sarah. No, thank you. I'm just having a quick look in the chat. Um, I know that Anne 
can stay with us when we move on to hear from Joanne. But Sarah, I know that, that you have to, to, to go now. So thank you on behalf of everybody here this morning for, for sharing your presentation and also being willing to um, follow up and um, share your other work and uh, to, act, to act as a contact point for people. Um, that has been incredibly inspiring and I can see lots of um, affirmation claps coming up on screen uh, right wow. now. Um, to sort of um, share that view. Um, so so thank you. We don't want to keep you back from your important work no. in the doing. <laughs> no, it's OK. Just to say we're launching the um, I think we're launching the films and other creative arts projects on the 27th of June and it will be hybrid. So if anyone wants to join that, um, I can put my email. It's free. I'll just pop my email in the box if that's OK. But yeah, thank you for having me and enjoy the rest of your webinar. Well done, Sarah. Thank you. And thank you for putting those links in the chat. And uh, as Diana said, this is an opportunity to sort of inspire and uh, help people drive things forward. And we're going to be thinking more at the end of our morning about one conversation or one action that you might take as a result of this. And I'm sure you've stimulated quite a lot of thinking on that. So um, thank you. So what we're going to do now is is move on to hearing from our third speaker, um, Joanne. So I'll um, hand over to, to you, Joanne. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so um, I'm currently um, the performance improvement lead for a specific project, um, which is, does include inclusion. And much of what I'm going to talk about actually was done in my previous role. Um, but and as well, I just want to say I'm not expert about this we're not doing it all singing or dancing you've probably got some really good examples yourselves um so um this is just some thoughts from a local authority perspective on how we managed to join some of those data sets together and then what we've done as a result of that um do you want me to take control here or do you want to move on i'm happy either way I'm happy to, to control the okay, slides if that works for you. Yep, that's fine. Yep. <coughs> um, so the first part of this was about us developing um, a data dashboard that cut across um, education, health and care. Um, it's, I think, automatically, well, particularly from a local authority perspective, um, the data around SEND is very education focused. Um, and so um, about how, how you kind of get beyond that. So we had have a governance structure of a strategic board, a delivery board, and then three subgroups underneath that, one of which is a performance subgroup who um, I suppose developed um, working, um, developed that dashboard. So we had those three pledges, which are on your screen there about intervening early, working in partnership to keep children in school and keeping children and young people safe and connected to their local communities. And I think that um, we've kind of already touched on it, but um, obviously having that, that being part of that structure with the um, that support does help those data sharing. Um, issues but also just to start somewhere um as i said in answer to one of the previous questions that thing about we're still developing it um i think that that is one of those things that it, it will still be developed um you know as i say doing this i feel slightly like um everybody else is probably far more expert and far, there's probably examples that are far um more joined up than, than we've been, because you can then start to see what would be great if we could, if it'd be great if we could. And I think sometimes you can become overwhelmed with that ultimate goal. Um, and really it's just about starting somewhere. So underneath your values, your pledges, your whatever it is you've got, what could you measure um, that's health or social care data? Um, I think is a is a good starting point, and once you've got one or two things, it's then easier to to then start thinking about what else. Um, so, for example, um, we did inc we included waiting times data for um, speech and language therapists, um, pediatric physio, and yeah, um, in our dashboard, we then through the 
um, through data sharing um, and have a flag on the NHS systems, which means that we can then report on those waiting times for children with an EHCP, as well as the whole cohort to see whether their experience is any different. Um, as we say, as, and the other thing as well is I think that sometimes um, it's really hard to think what could be measured. And I would just say, just think in the broadest sense, loosely linked, just get some get something because then you say so you can can build on that. Um, so data sharing and data processing, I think I've probably wiped it from my mind, um, the months and months of work that it goes into and conversations that go into um, setting them up. Um, but I say usually there is something there, even if it's for a different um, different service area that can be um, developed. And um, what made our data sharing easier um, in terms of allowing a flag for an EHCP to be put onto the health systems was that um, was gathering the NHS numbers at the um, assessment stage, um, education, health and care needs assessment stage, um, and adding those onto the education system, which meant that there was a um, a common field um, for um, sharing that data. I think that that is probably one of the biggest barriers is ensuring a common field, and I think. Personally, my experience has been harder internally and um, we use different systems for social care and education and joining those two because of a lack of common field is is can can be more difficult in a lot of ways. Um, so. Yeah, can you move on to the next slide, please? Um, so that I suppose that's about, you know, that's all well and good. You can collect, a collect the data, you can um, report it on a monthly basis, um, which in itself is important because um, that regular monitoring and as early as possible, so not, not with a lag, or too much lag on the data if you can, um, is really important to be able to monitor whether there's um, blips in the data or trends. There's been times in the past where we've seen um, something increase or decrease and in a particular month and said, actually, we're not going to investigate that now because we're not sure if that's seasonality or a change in a in a in personnel or a change in a system. We're going to see and watch it for the next few months. So obviously there is that um, just the regular monitoring enables you to do that. Um, I think so that what's more important um, is about the discussions around it and the importance of having um, data analysts and the people with those type of skills really embedded into the, into the services and knowing what's going on so that so that when they see something in the data they've got they know either who to go to or which conversations to have or can link it up with things that they know are happening on the ground. Um, you know what's causing it um, and when we do see a change in the trend, what are the possible links? Um, unfortunately, I think um, data always asks more questions than it answers. That's OK. Um, and I think that's really um that you say that's okay because it comes out of those discussions and and the data does help to back up the feeling on the ground often um so yes but that's about the the turning it into intelligence is a number on a page is one thing but actually the conversations around that help to to turn that into um intelligence and not looking at it in isolation so um we had um an increase in mediations and tribunals. Um, what what was that linked to? There were some theories around was that, is what are the right or if any other links between that and um, declines to assess or declines to issue where the source of the needs assessment request has come from. Um, all those kind of things by looking at all the data in a whole rather than individual bits of data to then have um, some um, deep dives into some of that. And I think there's 
it's so useful as well um that um that those deep dives have a representation from across the partnership because different people will have different perspectives on that um and i just just spot it oh i've lost totally lost my mouse which i was just moving um but yeah i totally agree with what julia is saying that actually as well it does help to disprove anecdotal evidence as well sometimes um sometimes um things are said and i I guess part of it is the data of my data in my data bit of my brain, but I just want to know the evidence for it. Um, are the numbers behind it? Because some and I think I think though that that also does cause does allow for those discussions. So if people are experiencing one thing, but the data saying a different thing, why is that? That there has to be something else in there, doesn't there? So, um, yeah, if you can go on to the next slide. Thanks. So. Um, just some sp specific examples of um, where we've done things as a result of um, noticing things in the data. Um, so, as I expect, the majority of people on this call have experienced, as well as an increased um, prevalence of children and young people with autism and speech and language needs, we've also got an increasing number of children and young people with social, emotional and mental health needs. Um, increasing referrals to CAMS. Um, we also were seeing a lot of those referrals to CAMS um, not reaching the threshold for CAMS. Um, and also, as Sarah talked a lot about, the increases in suspensions and permanent exclusions. Um, so as a result of that, um, there's there's a variety of things that um, have happened. Um, closer working between CAMS and early help. So um, early help workers linking in with CAMS and linking to um, into the into the primary care network so GPs can refer to them rather than directly to CAMS um, did a deep dive into those I've termed their inappropriate referrals to find out where they were coming from and therefore as a result of knowing the source of those we were able to do some um training and education around around that and what else is is on offer um there's a whole new offer um to with to meet children and people meet the needs of children and young people with a lower level of need mental health support teams in schools um connect working in schools um with staff and parents so increasing training um and to kind of um reduce requests for assessment for, for those with um social emotional and mental health needs um and I mean, it's it requires a whole culture change, but those are some of the things that um, that have been done. Um, as I say, we we specifically a couple of years ago noticed a much higher rate of suspensions of permanent exclusions for children in, or young people in year seven and eight. Um, so, an enhanced transition project was set up to support the transition um, of identified. Um, children between primary and secondary school to try and reduce those um those exclusions at that stage um and we we also we have an an ARP review going on at the minute and as part of that um we're talking about increasing um SEM provision and uh, one of our secondary schools is going to um have a um, provision for for um, some of those young people as a result of of this work. Move on. Yeah, great. Um, a couple more examples. In the monthly data, we noticed um, an increasing number and proportion of um, requests for assessment for children and young people um, or children who are under five. So whilst um, that is potentially uh, good in terms of early identification. Um, why? Why so many? We also have um, an increase in health notifications as well for those younger children. Um, 
we'd seen um, an increase in parental requests as well. And whilst as I say, not all those requests will then uh, result in an assessment or in, a, in an EHCP. Um, that led us to think, what what could we be doing differently? And so um, we've had a group set up who are working to um, set up an early years inclusion service that I'm not allowed to call a hub. Um, so the idea of that is to pull together um, some services, some of the targeted services um, to with an aim of reducing requests for assessment because needs being met um, at either a universal or a targeted level before the need for those specialist services. Um, it's a little while ago, but we did as well through the data sharing with the NHS, um, managed to share some data around secondary care. So we were able to look at hospital data, which we were able to cut um, by children who have an EHCP as opposed to those who don't, um, and also by gender and primary need. And I think in terms of going back to that, turning that data into intelligence, you know, that is just a list or a flag on the system or a chart. Um, we had some workshops with all the partner agencies to talk about why some of those um, things that seem to be coming out of the data might be. Um, next one, please. Um, and then another couple of examples of of those data linkages. So, um, as I say, what has felt harder was joining our local authority data sets together, um, and we had got to a point where we could um, join the social care and the education data sets together so that for those children with SEN, both Senseport and those with an EHCP, we could also identify other characteristics. So um, whether they're open to social care and at what level, um, whether they um, are open to youth offending or to um, have pupil premium, um, their ethnicity, um, all sorts of other things, whether they're um, a child missing from education, um, just to help understand those um, multiple vulnerabilities around those um, children, young people. And whilst um, obviously that's very useful for um, inspection purposes, the other use we've made of it, which isn't isn't huge, but is to um, on the on the re weekly reports that are run for. Um, our phase transfers um, and annual review, phase transfer and annual reviews is to add a flag so that the officers working on those know um, whether that, that child or young person may also be having um, any social care reviews as well. Um, and not specifically linked to SEND, but um, the through um, NCER, um, the virtual and the virtual school heads. Um, there was a lot of work done a few years ago on bringing together schools data specifically for the looked after cohorts. Um, so attainment data and um, attendance data. Um, and through that, our virtual school head was able to um, make a link between the SDQ scores and their educational outcomes, um, which then um, helped with a to um, develop a, a trauma informed offer for for those young people. Um, those are just some examples of of things that have been done as a result of it. Um, as I say, I'm sure that so much more could be done. Um, but hopefully that gives a flavour and I think the next in the next part of the session gives other people an opportunity to um, share some of their the things that they've been doing as well. Thank you, Joanne, and really helpful to get us to move from thinking just about the data to thinking about what we do with it and how it helps us answer the questions and look at where areas of improvement and change that we can make. We've got a couple of minutes before we go into our breakout room, so I would like to give people an opportunity to ask you any questions if that's OK. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll just pause to see if there's anybody wants to put their hand up to uh, ask Joanne any questions. Uh, 
OK. Fine, thank you. And uh, lots of comments in the chat about how brilliant it's been, Joanne, and, gr and grateful for your contribution. I think we do have a lot of people that are busy and needing to think about moving on to other meetings, which I think is inevitable uh, when you have the audience that we have. But um, having had such three powerful um, presentations, I know that there's real value in drawing people together into smaller groups. Ah, before I continue, I can see one hand up. Vivian, do you want to come in quickly? Yes, please. Um, thanks, Kate. Uh, Joanne, could I just ask you, you said at the opening of your presentation that this wasn't your current role now, but could you just tell me what your background is in how you got that partnership together to even start so, that piece of so, work, please? Yeah, so, mm -hmm. previous, so previously I was in our performance team um, with, and my, my role in that was specifically, well, was around education. I suppose in a way that was helpful because I my areas of focus were educa primary education, SEN and um, 0 to 19 services. So yeah. I did have that bit of a link with with health then anyway. Um, so it's just I'm I'm just still doing a performance role now, just yeah. um, specifically for um, a different review. So but that, that was and I was part of um, the governance structure at all the levels when it was set up, which I think was helpful yeah, um, to pull that through. Yeah, I think that's the um, key key area that you need people on board, as you said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian, and thank you, Joanne. So um, we're going to move into the smaller breakout rooms now, which gives people an opportunity to come together with colleagues from other areas to reflect on what's been heard or the questions that you'd like to ask and have a wider discussion around the, 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 the uh, data to intelligence that we've been talking about so far this morning. So Thea, I think you're going to help us move into groups. Um, and this is an opportunity to sort of not only ask each other questions, but share examples about what's going on in your local area and to make those connections and see it's an opportunity to network. Uh, we'll be in those groups from 11.30 up until quarter to 12, where we'll be coming back together for the plenary session. And there's no need to feedback. It's just an opportunity to come together and uh, discuss. So thank you, Thea. I know that quite a few people unfortunately had to leave us for the meetings at 11.30 and um, I hope when you found your way into a breakout room you were able to sort of meet with colleagues from across the country and have some useful um, discussions um, around data and, and how it's been used in your area in terms of send improvement. Um, I think one of the reflections from the group that I joined was that whilst SEND is already an area where there are lots of acronyms and abbreviations, that when it comes to data, it seems to sort of ramp up even further. Um, so um, just a reflection from my point. So that leads us into some further self-reflection. And uh, we really want you to think on from the conversations that you've heard and the conversations that you've had around one conversation that you are going to have now um, and who with as you move forward, uh, one action that you're going to take and one change that you will influence. And we're going to ask you to do this on a mentee so that we can then sort of see that anonymously um, across the across the screen um, as, as a, as a put kind of a point of sharing, but also as a pledge for you to take away and do that um, as a result of this conversation. Thank you. So these are going to be coming up on the screen now. Yep, so connecting into other initiatives across your local area, having conversations with partner agencies. Yep, finding out where things are at. What are the possible links? Yeah, having conversations with the ICB. Thank you, keep them coming in. Yeah, the importance of uh, ensuring senior figures across agencies and organisations are connecting. And using this as a springboard to have that conversation. 
thinking further about yeah we collect the data but what do we do with it how can we help help us improve outcomes and uh, join up with health do you like me to go to the next question okay uh, yeah. thank you Good to see the actions coming through. So some practical considerations and some strategic actions. Yeah, please do share the presentation widely and utilise the links. Development of a transition dashboard, interesting. Yeah, please do share the pull up a chair, the chair films. They were really powerful. And if you get the opportunity to look at the ones that um, Sarah wasn't unfortunately able to share with us. Will we be sharing the mentee with the assets from the uh, webinar, Thea? Uh, sorry, Kate, I didn't quite catch that. Could you repeat that again, please? Well, we, well, we would be sharing the uh, what Menti generates for these three questions with the with the we slides. Do, right yes, now. yeah. Great, thank you. So, just conscious of time, if we move to the next question, thank you. some real thinking about how to uh, go on and influence at lots of different levels thank you thank you conscious of um time um if anybody quickly wants to add any one last response Joanne, you have a hand up. Can I, it was just some, just a thought. Um, we just we mentioned it in the breakout group I was in. Was um, so um, we've been doing our day sharing with next the um, uh, commissioners there. So, but what we've discovered as part of that is, um, although they support. The local authorities in the northeast different local authorities were maybe asking for different things or had slightly different data sharing agreements or they do a different thing for that local authority so i definitely think there it if you are looking to do something like that it's worth contacting other local authorities in your area if you have a similar um service to see what other people are asking for rather than um 
re rewrite it um, because um, what we discovered was that just because they're doing something for one local authority in the northeast does not mean that they will necessarily think to offer you that. Um, so there, you know, I suppose there is that word to share things yourselves uh, regionally. No, that's really helpful advice, Joanne. Thank you. I think that's a really good point. Um, in that sometimes you you have to you have to think local to overcome some of the barriers with with the with your particular setup. But it's really important to harness that learning and the kind of the the steps that other areas took and the problems and the ways that they solved them um, to bring them into your kind of learning. And I think that's one of the the things that I'm going to take away that you said earlier, um, Joanne. I think it was data asks more questions than it answers, and that's okay. Um, and to sort of see this as a series of problems to solve sort of step by step so rather than seeing the elephant as something you've got to eat but break it down and eat it sort of spoonful by spoonful so um thea has put in the chat that uh, we would really value you taking the time and we're going to finish at 5 to 12 to allow people the five minutes before midday to complete our um, evaluation form um this is incredibly important and I know people um, often find it something uh, a step too far at the end of an event to complete because they have to rush off for whatever they're going to be doing next but it, it helps us in multiple ways it tells us about you know whether we've got it right in terms of the event and the planning and it also helps us demonstrate the impact of the work that we're doing for for the DfE and um, that it helps us in thinking about the next sort of events that we're going to have and also informs our future work along through the RISE um, partnership that we have. So we would be really, really grateful if you did take the time to complete it. And there's something on screen now and there's also something in, in, in the chat. This is a really valuable part of the of the morning for us. Um, so before before I close, I just want to sort of thank our speakers again, Joanne and Anne still with us, grateful for your sort of continued contribution and the things that you've put in the chat and the links that you've made. And also for Sarah, who has um, made a commitment to following up if people would find it helpful. Um, please do um, when the, re, um, the recording and the um, uh, slide deck comes through do uh, share widely with your colleagues to sort of help the conversations and uh, generate kind of um, enthusiasm and commitment to sort of continuing to use data to help uh, improve outcomes for, for children and young people with SEND. Thank you everybody for joining today and staying with us to the end. No, it's always difficult to carve out time in busy schedules for busy people, uh, particularly there's a lot of pressure under there. So um, I will draw things to a close now. I will stop recording. Thank you for um, a great and interesting webinar this morning and please do fill that evaluation out for us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.